about where is he leading in our life eternity in our death of resurrection at the last of victory unrevealed until it sees us something all alone can see good morning sojourners and good morning to all who may be worshiping with us for the very first time. We thank God for this fifth Sunday of Lent, another Sunday in our observance of Women's History Month, and there are other specials as, uh, that will be a part of this service of worship. Sharing in this service today as liturgists is Megan Wallace, a time with children will be provided by Allison Lenny. We have a moment of special music when Dylan Duke will uh, play for us. There will be a special presentation on the one great hour of sharing appeal that will be provided by Cinder Haley Hatton. And Steve Brinkley is with us. You've just heard his wonderful voice. Karen, Reverend Karen Mann is with us to help with the uh, joys and concerns. And she and Ian Little are providing technical assistance for today's service of worship. Now with all of these people present, if you are here with us, that completes the puzzle. Welcome to this time of worship. May God bless all of you as we worship God together. And now, Megan Wallace for our call to worship. Good morning, everyone. I will explain briefly my setting. We had a power outage at my house this morning, so I packed everything up. Welcome to Miss Megan's classroom. Um, we were able to get here and so I'm glad to be with everyone today. Let us gather to worship. Oh God, we wish to see Jesus. We come to worship, to pray and learn. We come looking for Jesus in scripture lessons, in our own life experiences, in helping our world in prayers for each other. We seek to follow in the way of Jesus. We lay bare before God and one another, our own wilderness journey filled with gladness and hope, with reluctance and sorrow, with fear and confusion. Oh God, speak to us. Show us, touch us with your presence. Let our Lenten journey lead us to Jesus so that we may show forth Jesus in our lives, our faith community, and our world. Amen. <clears throat> Let us look to God in prayer. God of the journey, you invite us, the church, to accept the cost and joy of discipleship and to be your servants in the service of others. In so doing, may your presence be our guide and Jesus our model. May we respond to you in loving faithfulness. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and his, this host of witnesses. O oh God, we confess that the sins of racial hatred, xenophobia, cultural bias, and other prejudices distort your divine plan for our human lives. 
You created us in divine likeness, diverse and beautiful. In every person of every race, sexual orientation and culture is your image. But too often, we fail to recognize your image in all. Forgive us. You created us in divine freedom to be free. In every decision, every choice is your possibility for justice. But too often, we fail to advocate your justice for all. Forgive us. You created us for divine abundance to tend and share in every garden, every social structure is your seed of community. But too often, we fail to create that community which includes all and gives to all equal access to your abundant life. Forgive us. Open our eyes to distinguish good from evil. Open our hearts to desire good over evil. Strengthen our wills to choose good and not evil so that we may create among us your beloved community. We will now have hear the assurance of pardon. Hear the good news. God's gift of grace in Jesus Christ forgives us and sets us free to live full human lives in community. We may go forth confident of the grace to see with new eyes beyond all prejudices, to imagine with renewed fervor, justice and mercy for all, and to create with new will, a community where all are given access to God's abundant life. Thanks be to God. And this is the time that we continue to reflect on the needs of our community, especially those who are in need and who are feeling hungry. Oftentimes, if we are gathered together, we see the children pushing the cart and we fill it with cereal or peanut butter or soup. And there are still those needs and we need to remember that and find ways to continue to reach out to our local food banks um, with donations of food or monetary donations um, as those needs are still important in our community. And now I'm gonna turn everything over to Allison Lenny for our time with children. Hi everybody, I am so glad to be with you. Um, there's a lot of exciting things to talk about today. Uh, so first of all, happy Women's History Month. Um, and a really exciting thing happened yesterday uh, for the University of Virginia. And I know I've got some fans out there that are like, Allison, did you actually watch the basketball game? Yes, I did. I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about today is this exciting news. <gasps> Look at that. Can everybody see this? So for the first time in the history of the whole program, uh, the University of Virginia Women's Swimming and Diving Championship, they won the whole thing. And I'm so proud of them. And I'm especially proud of them for their picture with their masks on, uh, being a good leader and showing us how it's done. So I found that to be a particularly exciting thing um, for Women's History Month. And then another thing that's on my mind is um, one of my favorite books. And it's called Little Leaders. Um, so let me go back to the big screen here. Okay, so this is a, a, one of my favorite authors. Her name is Vashti Harrison, and she writes a lot of really cool books and pictures. And I thought it would be neat this year, uh, today, to do Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History. And one of the things I really like about that is that it lets me keep celebrating Black History Month um, from February and come right on into Women's History Month. So I thought this is a particularly neat book to share with you all. Uh, so it was hard to choose. You'll see here, there's a lot, you probably can't read all those, but there's a lot of really cool women in here that she writes about, like 
Ella Fitzgerald, who's one of my favorite singers of all times, and Zora Neale Hurston, whose books mean so much to me, and Maya Angelou, and Oprah Winfrey, and oh, some really neat women who, Bessie Coleman, and some women who were pilots and one of the first generals. Uh, I mean, there's just, there's so many. And at the end, she even has a list of people she forgot she couldn't include because she had to stop somewhere. So it just reminds us there's so many women who do cool things. But as I was deciding which one to read today, I thought the story about a little girl uh, named Ruby Bridges would be neat because a lot of times when we talk about Women's History Month, we talk about grown women, but we don't always talk about little girls. And, and who do really powerful things. So this is a picture of Ruby, and that gives you an idea of what her art looks like. And then it's just a quick page of reading, and I'm going to tell you about Ruby. Okay, so she's an activist, and she made history in 1960, when at the age of six, she became the first student to attend an all-white school in New Orleans. Six years old, she did this. Although some other cities had already begun to desegregate, as was the law since a Supreme Court ruling in 1954 declared that separate but equal was in fact not equal, there were some cities where schools were still divided by color. But after an important ruling, the court ordered the schools in New Orleans to be desegregated. And Ruby was selected to be the first black student to attend William France Elementary School. Every step of the way was a challenge. Long before her first day, Ruby had to take an exam, even to gain admission to the school, one that was written in such a way that Black students were less likely to pass it. Her father feared what it might mean if she passed, but her mother pushed for Ruby to take it for the sake of a better education. Many people did not support desegregation. And on Ruby's first day, protesters surrounded the school. Ruby had to be escorted by her mother and U.S. Marshals in order to enter. She was so young, six years old, it was hard for her to grasp what was going on. Many years later, she said she thought it was a Mardi Gras celebration, which is a party before Lynn, because of the number of people out on the streets. She had no idea they were there to protest her. Once she was inside the school, the difficulties continued. White parents pulled their kids from classes and many of the teachers refused to teach a black student. Only one person agreed to teach her, a young woman who had recently moved to Louisiana from Boston. Miss Henry became Ruby's only confidant and friend at school. During the fight for civil rights, Ruby became a symbol for, for the vulnerability all black Americans faced then and today. Still. Uh, and so it's just exciting to me to think about Ruby going to school because I know a lot of you are going to school in a new situation and a lot of teachers are going back to school. And it's not the same as Ruby, but it's also related to Ruby and how important school is and kids and stuff like that. So I just wanted you to know that I love you all very much. And it's hard to believe we've been doing this for a year now. Um, and I'll be excited when we can be back together. But until then, I love that we do this part so well. I'm very proud of our church. I'm proud of all of you for the way we're together. So the last thing I wanna share with you is that um, one of the neat things is that uh, you, because of all these cool virtual things, you can go see Ruby in the book festival this week. And one of our friends of Sojourners is a woman named Jane Kulo. And she's in charge of the book festival. And she's made sure that we can learn from um, a lot of different people. So this is uh, Vashti Harrison, who was also a, a woman who went to the University of Virginia. And these are a lot of the books that she shares with people. And so what I'm going to do is put in the chat um, all of the times you can see her this week. So it's pretty exciting. You can see her virtually on Tuesday and on Thursday. Tuesday, she'll talk about one of her books like this. Um, and then also on Thursday, you get to hear about why it's so important that we have different kinds of kids uh, in books, uh, in children's literature, so that we all grow up seeing all different kinds of children, all different colors of children, all different people from around the world. So. Anyway, it's exciting to be with you today. 
Um, and I love you very much. So I'm gonna put it in the chat so you can know when to go. Uh, and here's the great thing. If you can't go the next day, they put it on there and you can watch it on a video. Um, so this time for the first time, we don't have to miss anything. Uh, so thank you all very much. And then talking about continued special things, it is my pleasure to tell you that our next thing in the service um, is a, a special piece of music, Furelise, played by our very own Dylan Duke. So uh, I'm not sure how this service can get any better, but I bet it will. Okay, everybody, I'll see you soon. Absolutely beautiful. I am so glad Dylan was able to share that with us. Now we're going to move into our readings for today. Our contemporary reading is a short piece by Nikki Giovanni, who's an American poet and activist and educator. If it's chocolate, we can dip it. If it's a golf ball, we can chip it. If it's gum, we can chew it. I hope it's love so we can do it. And then today's scripture lesson is from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, 
it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my, there my servant be also. Who serves me, the Father will honor. Now, my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I just want to say to uh, Steve Brinkley, your job might really be in danger as long as Dylan is around. We thank you so very much, Dylan, for your contribution to this service of worship. And, uh, and we thank all of you for your presence here this day. Technology is uh, misbehaving just a little this morning. The title of our sermon is Seeing Jesus. Seeing Jesus. On a day when, on a day when everything has gone very well, I've had these uh, challenges with my fowls. Several years ago, some colleagues and I were blessed to receive a grant from the Lilly Foundation. The grant enabled the seven of us to travel to any city, anywhere in the world, to meet with religious leaders and to talk about faith leadership and worship. One of the trips we took was um, a trip to the city of New York, Brooklyn, in fact, where we went to the very well-known Concord Baptist Church of Christ, where Dr. Gardner Taylor had been pastor for many years. As the then pastor of that church, Dr. Gary Simpson walked around with us to show us that grand worship facility 
we were impressed by the scriptures that had been etched into the stone of that building. For example, there above the main entrance of the church are the words from Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And every week as worshipers enter that sanctuary, if they look up, they're able to see those welcoming words. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. There were other key biblical phrases in other locations around that building. However, the phrase that stood out most vividly for us was not one that was positioned on the building in full view. No, it was not that at all. It was a phrase that was written on the floor of the pulpit at Concord Baptist Church, where every preacher who stepped into the pulpit could read them. Trinity Episcopal Church in Boston, uh, Copley Square, Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta has those words on the floor of the pulpit in their primary worship space. They are, of course, the words that some Greeks spoke to Philip when both they and Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem. The Greeks were more than likely non-Jews who were fascinated by Judaism's antiquity and its profound ethical teachings. They were often referred to as God-bearers or God-fearers or God-bearers. And they were numerous throughout that region. Many of these god would have converted to Judaism if it did not require circumcision. Along with Jesus and his disciples, the god were on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But Jesus was also on his way to Jerusalem, to suffer, to die, and to be ra raised again on the third day. When Philip reported to Jesus that the Greeks had uh, asked to see him, Jesus responded, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This statement, Sojourners, marks a major turning point in John's gospel. The gospel of John is divided into two, let me say two sections. The first section is called the book of signs. And the second section, the book of glory. In the book of signs, the first part of John, Jesus performs seven miracles that John refers to over and over again as signs. They begin with Jesus turning wine into water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. And it culminates with the extraordinary miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. Throughout the book of signs, Jesus makes repeated references to the fact that his hour 
or his time had not yet come. When his mother tells him to uh, turn the water into wine, or she simply told him that they were out of wine. And uh, Jesus said to his mother, my hour has not yet come. You will remember that phrase in that biblical text. Then in John 7, 8, Jesus tells his disciples that he would not go to Jerusalem for the festival of booths because his, quote, time has not yet fully come. But when the Greeks asked to see Jesus, he knew that the hour had come for him to be glorified. As Jesus uh, amplifies his mysterious comment about the hour, he said, we realize that Jesus's idea of glory, uh, uh, it's good to remember that Jesus's idea of glory and our idea of glory are vastly different. For Jesus to be glorified was to embrace the cross the epitome of suffering. And so we read these words in that text. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Because non-Jews, such as the Greeks, were seeking to meet Jesus, he knew that his mission was no longer restricted to Israel, but had become a universal mission. It was time for him to be lifted up, that is to be crucified, so that all people would be drawn to himself. Notice the contrast, Sojourners. For most of us, Glory is about gaining more, more money, more prestige, more power. And surely we have witnessed a lot of that during the previous four years. But for Jesus, glory was not about gaining more. It was about giving more. He demonstrates this throughout John's gospel but nowhere more vividly than in, this, in the final chapters. He gives himself to his friends by washing their feet. Then he gives himself to the whole world by dying on the cross. It is the completion of the great arc of self-emptying that began with the opening verse of John, the cosmic word by which God spoke creation into being descends from on high and is clothed in flesh. We beheld his glory. The word incarnate heals the sick, and so we pray for those who are suffering feeds the multitudes, we pray for those who are hungry, and we give through our collection cart, raises the dead, and finally completes his task of dying on the cross. And only then resumes the glory that is rightly his. Sir, we would see Jesus. Dr. Gardner Taylor knew that everyone who stepped 
into the poor pit of Concord Baptist Church, who presumed to preach the gospel, needed to think about these words. Because the great temptation of preaching is to give out hearers something other than Jesus. We want them to see our, uh, uh, we want them to see sometimes how much we have learned. We want them to know all about the daily news. We want to tell a witty joke or two, but too often there's little in preaching that suggests we are concerned with presenting Jesus. But it is not only preachers who do this, all around us are people who want to see Jesus. Do they see Jesus in us? If not in us, then in whom will they see evidence of his presence? If not on our watch, then when? When will they come to know that we are representatives, we are the body of Christ in the world. Do they see the servant Lord who washed the feet of others? Do they see the prophet who cleansed the temple? Do they see the healer who made the blind to see? If we are to let people see Jesus in us, sojourners, then we must go ourselves and sit at his feet. Let him heal us, feed us with his broken body. And above all else, we are to stand at the foot of the cross and make a decision. We must decide whose side we are on. We all need a lot more Jesus. It's not only a problem for preachers, it is a problem for every one of us who are called by the name Christian. Sir, we would see Jesus, the Greek said to Philip. We live in a world where men and women want to see Jesus. So that when others want to see Jesus, they can see him in us. My mother made it on that farm there in North Carolina where nine children were raised. Lived a life that was defined by her faith. It was not unusual at virtually any time to hear mom singing one of those old Negro spirituals. One that stands out in my mind at this moment is one written by Jeremy Camp. Mom would begin very quietly. <clears throat> in the morning when I rise. She wasn't so careful about counting the pauses and the notes. She would wait a while and then she would give it another line. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And it didn't happen every time, but raising nine children, there were always three or four of us around her at most of the time. And then when she would get to the chorus, she would have a little small church choir right there in our home as others would join in. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. And she would sing it several times. But for mom, it was not just 
a commitment for Sunday morning. It was not a commitment for one day or one week because she would always end it with the eschatological verse. Lord, when I come to die, Lord, when I come to die, Oh, when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. Day after day, year after year, we were blessed to hear this testimony from my mother, and it helped to shape our lives forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Oh God, out of the depths we cry to you. Because the injustice in our world is too much to bear. We cry out for those who are abused, enslaved, raped and treat it as less than your children. We cry out for our brothers and sisters who are weak, exploited, and are led to believe that the truth is a lie and that a lie is the truth. We cry out to you for the children of our world who grow hungry for no reason at all when we possess the means to feed all. Today, we ask you to move us from despair above the challenges in our lives and world and to empower us to bring your divine love to all in need. Dear God, we are your people, and Sojourners is your church. You challenge us to act as your presence in this world. Grant that the world may see the light of Jesus in all of us. Amen. And now, Sojourners, we present to you Cindy, who's going to make a special appeal on behalf of the One Great Hour of Sharing. Good morning, friends. I'm eager to talk with you about One Great Hour of Sharing, the United Church of Christ's annual drive to raise money for its global missions. During the month of March, UCC congregations all over the country are taking up collections to support underserved communities around the world. This year, more than ever, people in developing nations need our support as they strive to recover in the wake of a pandemic that has hit their societies hard. In many instances, pandemic related hardships have exacerbated already existing long-term problems tied to sluggish economies, high unemployment, weak national and regional infrastructures, and overburdened healthcare systems. In addition, a number of countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East have been grappling with serious refugee crises due to wars, 
militant insurgencies and border conflicts, dire situations that have been made worse by climate change, natural disasters, and now the pandemic. By donating to One Great Hour of Sharing, you have an opportunity to provide assistance to hard-pressed villages and neighborhoods around the world as they struggle to meet basic needs. 95% of all donations goes directly to the designated community projects. In 2018, One Great Hour of Sharing raised over $1.8 million and the same was true in 2019. Uh, those were the most recent uh, figures I could find, uh, but the point is that when you consider how far a dollar goes in many developing nations, you can be sure that your contributions make a big difference in people's lives. So I am now, uh, just bear with me for a minute, I'm going to uh, share my screen. So as you can see from this slide, the focus of uh, this year's One Great Hour of Sharing campaign is providing good, clean water. This year's motto, love, let flow, uh, sorry, excuse me, let love flow uh, is based on a passage from the 49th chapter of the book of Isaiah. You can see that scripture passage here to the left of your screen. I will read just a small, uh, the, the highlighted verse here in the middle. Nobody hungry, nobody thirsty, shade from the sun, shelter from the wind for the compassionate one guides them, takes them to the best springs. The UCC has helped fund water projects in various places, including Vietnam, Nicaragua, and Thailand. This year, a water project in Kitui, Kenya is being showcased. Kitui, as you can see from this slide, is a town in the south uh, eastern central region of Kenya. Uh, in many ways, Kitui's residents face challenges similar to those faced by our partners in Ojola. Um, you can see Ojola marked here on the map uh, in the uh, western part of Kenya. Uh, Ojola is about 325 miles or so from Kitui. Um, and many of you will be familiar with Ojola because we have been sponsoring school children and contributing to water tanks and things that improve their health. Uh, we've been doing this now since 2002. So our friends in Ojola sometimes have water issues much like the folks in Kitui and a number of other places in Kenya where the UCC has helped to dig boreholes and wells, construct dams and install water tanks. These improvements make a demonstrable impact on people's lives. So much depends on good, clean water. Please consider making a donation next week uh, March 28th, when we will take up a special collection for one great hour of sharing. Of course, you are welcome to contribute earlier if you choose. Simply go to the website, the Sojourners website, uh, click on donate, and there is an option to contribute to one great hour of sharing. Alternatively, you can always write a check send it to the uh, and send it to the church office. Uh, checks should be made out to Sojourners UCC with one great hour of sharing or OGHS written in the memo line. Uh, the church staff and officers will make sure that your contribution reaches uh, the place, uh, the appropriate place uh, in the at the UCC. 
Thank you so much for considering making a donation. Thank you for letting your love flow. Amen. And thank you, Cindy, for sharing that wonderful focus message on one great hour of sharing. Because we know of the tendency among sojourners to present generous gifts, let us proceed with a prayer of dedication for the gifts we believe we will, will receive for local work this week and for one great hour sharing next week. And as you have indicated, we can begin the one great hour sharing gifts as soon as we wish, if we go to the website. Let us pray. God, there are many who wish to see Jesus. In joy and celebration of the many gifts that we share, we ask you to bless all our offerings. May the light of Jesus shine in all the world. Amen. And now we present to you Reverend Karen Mann, who's going to coordinate our joys and concerns. Thank you, Pastor Morgan. As we prepare for this time of prayer, I ask that you submit your joys or concerns either in the chat box on Zoom or in the comments section on Facebook. And please remember that Facebook is a public forum. And while you are doing that, Steve is going to play a little music for us. Steve? Thank you, Steve. Evelyn Nazario says, uh, offers prayers for her friend, Awilda's wife, Tony. She's in a Brooklyn hospital with COVID since last week. Evelyn, we pray with you. Evelyn also says prayers for her ex-husband, Pedro, who suffered a massive heart attack in Colombia, South America in 2019 with no health insurance, now staying with his wife's family, still too weak to return to Hampton, Virginia where he lives, where his Medicare would be able, available to him. Evelyn, we pray with you and with Pedro. Um, let's see, Megan Wallace offers a joy. Erin has decided that her home for the next four years will be Shenandoah University. Congratulations, Erin, and uh, what a joy, amen. Barbara Brack says, please pray for my friend Patty, whose beloved dog is dying. Barbara, we pray with you. Megan Wallace also offers a concern. News that the blue heron that lives at our local lake has gotten trapped in some fishy line, fishing line and looks to be suffering greatly, Megan. Uh, we pray with you. Rachel Baum says, thanks to all who participated in the church. Oop, sorry, I scrolled too fast. Clean up yesterday. Job well done. Rachel, amen to that. Allison Liddy says, Enid asked me to do virtual presentation for the center this Wednesday, March 24th, 5.30. The title is, Do You Have Black Friends or You Just Know Black People? Please play, oh, sorry, y'all, I'm stuttering a little this morning. Please pray that God fills me with a good message and that I live up to Enid's faith in me and that I help people to learn. Allison, we have no doubt that you will live up to Enid's faith in you and help people to learn. So uh, we pray with you, but we know you'll do great. Uh, Scott Hirano prays for the murdered victims in Atlanta. 
and end of violence against women and end to racial hatred and discrimination. Scott, we pray with you and with folks in Atlanta and with the Asian American community. Marie Coles Baker says, asking prayers for our friend in Buffalo who has been in intensive care with COVID for almost four weeks. He's been moved to a COVID floor and able to text, we are joyful. Uh, Marie, we pray with you and amen that um, your friend is receiving the help that they need. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to look, switch over to Facebook. I'm a little behind, so if I missed you, I apologize. Ben Smith offers a joy that Stefan got news about his MBA applications this week. He got into his number one choice, Emory in Atlanta. Great school, Stefan, I graduated from Emory. Uh, prayers for our move there this fall. Oh, we will miss you guys, but uh, amen. We, and we pray for you in your uh, new season. Um, Diana Purdue says, I have a great joy this week. I received a job offer. Grateful, thanks be to God, to all my fellow sojourners who've been praying with me about this. Diana, we continue to pray with you, but amen to that. Deb Winslow offers prayers for April Jordan and her father, her and her family, her brother died unexpectedly on March 17th. Uh, Deb, we pray with you. And Mary Whittlesey says uh, prayers that she is having some medical issues, asking for prayers as she waits to see the doctor tomorrow. Mary, we pray with you. And like I said, I got a little lost in Facebook. So if I missed you somehow on Facebook, I apologize, but know that we hold you in our hearts and prayers. And now Pastor Morgan will join our prayers by offering a pastoral prayer. Pastor Morgan. Thank you very much, Reverend Mann. Let us look to God in prayer. Dear God, there's tremendous concern among us because of those who are coping in very serious ways with the COVID virus, even to the point of hospital confinement and ICU attention. There's anxiety because of the news that is yet being awaited regarding health conditions. Dear God, Yet in the midst of all that we experience, there are joys among us regarding opportunities for higher education, higher education that will change lives in significant ways. There is joy among us because of the ways your servants have stepped forward to fulfill tasks that lead to beautification of a place of worship. If the public would see Jesus, how great it is that they may look toward places of worship and see that they are handled with extraordinary care that they are receiving attention. Dear God, if we were to name every situation, we would be here quite a while. But you are an all-knowing God, and you are already aware of those conditions and circumstances that weigh heavily upon our hearts. Bless all participants at Sojourners and those who are friends of this congregation, we claim all of them. As we continue to grow in our understanding of the ministries to which we've been called, just as Jesus the Christ ministered to the Jewish community and then reach out beyond that community to the Greeks and the god fearers and others. We pray that we too might look for new ways 
to serve you by serving others, especially those least like ourselves. These blessings we ask in your many names. Amen. And now we'll be blessed with a closing hymn by Steve Brinkley. Thank you very much, Steve. What a beautiful song and what a great time of year to hear it. Sojourners, we thank you for your presence with us today. Let us continue to pray for those who have requested prayer to celebrate with those who have shared wonderful joys on this day. And let us be the body of Christ so the world may see Jesus. Let us now receive this brief benediction. Dear God, we, we thank you for today, for being with us, accepting our worship and prayers, and for guiding us on our way. Bless us as we go forth from our sheltering in places, and in turn, May we be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen.